Hi everyone, great to see you here. So um, before we begin, let's just let these two great uh, panel members introduce themselves. Uh, first of all, Yair. Hi, I'm uh, Yair Panet. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Wizits. We're a social casino company based in Tel Aviv. Uh, we have uh, four products on the market. Uh, targeting niche, niche, different niches. Uh, we're 10 employees. Uh, we've been in operations for about three years. Hi, my name is Derek Morton. Uh, I've been making games for about 22 years. My company is Flowplay. I found it in 2006. This is our 10th anniversary coming up. Uh, we make two games, Our World and Vegas World. Vegas World is our primary property. It's built on the, uh, the virtual world that we started building 10 years ago. It's a social casino, but uh, more of an MMO kind of approach to, to a social casino. Great. Thanks, guys. So uh, as you can all uh, probably uh, realize and expect, uh, this panel is going to talk a bit about how we try to do things a bit different. Uh, you all know that there are so many new apps or old apps that are coming out uh, all the time, many of them very, very similar to one another. And uh, we wanted to talk a bit about how we can take approaches to do things a bit different, how in such a saturated and uh, a competitive market, uh, players like these two guys can come in and try to uh, mix things around a little bit to differentiate themselves. So uh, maybe we'll begin just by hearing a bit of uh, each of your history or your business's history and the type of products that you made where you took a niche approach on the product side. So uh, we have four products on the market today. Uh, our first product is called Slotogram. That's the one we started with. And today it's a pretty, uh, uh, it's a video slot app. It's got a, f a lot of unique features, but it definitely has a mass market appeal. Um, we have Win Vegas, which is mechanical 3RM stepper machines, uh, Good Fortune Casino, which is Asian focused, and Fashion TV Games, which is a, a business to business uh, partnership that we have with Fashion TV. Now, uh, the way we basically see it is that the app is actually just a delivery method. And it makes sense to have an app that has a mass market appeal. However, the fringes. Uh, are getting bigger and bigger and players are looking for experiences that are different and the more you go niche uh, the more you see products that are very interesting uh, but not necessarily executed at a high level or at least don't have the depth of product that you're competing with when you go to mass market so on our video slots app we're competing with a slot of Mania, House of Fun, Heart of Vegas, uh, the Zynga apps. I mean, these are products that have are very robust, have years of product evolution, of great content. When we launched Win Vegas, for example, so we entered uh, the mechanical uh, area uh, a bit late, but I mean, the main players are, of course, Old Vegas and Canvas, uh, Viva on uh, mobile. But actually, we came with quite a deep technological platform that we already had. So by actually employing our technology to target a niche, uh, we were able to bring a product which is quite robust uh, from the get-go, whereas a lot of the companies that have been targeting the niche from the beginning actually come with a product that's a lot smaller. Uh, and we'll talk maybe a little bit uh, later, but uh, the main appeal of a niche strategy, in my opinion, is from the user acquisition side. It allows you to target the user acquisition much better. For us as a small company, that, is, uh, that was a huge game changer, and that changed our whole uh, KPIs and basically allowed us to start buying traffic at scale. Yeah, from the uh, niche product point of view, we, we like to uh, look at different demographics that we can approach. Most people in the social casino space are really just after a broad swath of uh, you know 60-year-old women and, and have probably a 65-35 split between women and men. Vegas World is that sort of broad uh, social casino demographic, but we also uh, have a, a version of the game uh, called Celebrity World, uh, which is in partnership with Justin Bieber. Uh, it's a much young, younger school skew, sort of a millennial approach. So there's, um, it's, it's around hip hop music. There's still casino games. There's still poker, blackjack, and all the other casino games. But there are nightclubs based on a nightclub in Los Angeles. Uh, Justin Bieber and Soulja Boy and a couple of the celebrities actually come to the game as their avatars and go dancing and go meet some of the people in the game and hang out with them. Um, we also are entering sports. Uh, we're the only social casino that has a sports book that has daily fantasy, uh, that has real-time betting on sports as you play, as you watch a game. Uh, we have five different sports games. We just launched the last one uh, a little while back. So, so we have Sports World that we're developing for men. 
uh, celebrity world we're de developing for millennials, and Vegas world is our core product for the, 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 the straight ahead social casino market. Okay, so it seems you've each found a kind of unique space within uh, this market. Yair actually brought up a very interesting point that, that we get it quite a lot from our, our clients. Yair mentioned that um, he, he sees that his niche product needs to take kind of a, a different approach on the UA front and allows him to scale the UA. I'd love to talk about that a bit more in depth because uh, maybe to, to ask this question more directly, many times when you do something uh, very niche or on the product end, you kind of ask yourself, do I have to be very niche on the marketing end or can I continue? and do what Slotomania or Zynga are doing as well and expect that to work for my niche product? So yeah, that's a great question. I mean, anyone who's in the space of social casino knows that user acquisition is really all... Since there is no, at least for us, no real organic path towards growth, it's all paid marketing. And actually being able to have the best uh, uh, paid marketing approach is really key to having a successful business. Now, what niche uh, uh, strategies allow you to do is they allow you to buy players where the ads are very targeted and the product is very targeted towards what they're looking because quite simply, it's very easy to either take your existing player base for us, for example, from our video slots app, see the players that like games, for example, that have an Asian appeal and then try to cross, uh, use that audience to buy lookalikes for our Asian product or the same for the mechanicals, that's one way. The other way is simply to buy players that like, that play products that we are competing with. And that allows us to go towards players. What we see is that the CPIs are quite comparable. When we buy for an American audience, we don't see a huge fluctuation on the CPI for video slots or for mechanicals. What we do see is higher LTV because basically they have, first of all, less choice in that space. And we're giving them something that's really more unique because when we're competing again, uh, if you take, for example, uh, the mechanical slots space, there are great products, but there are quite a few great products. Uh, there, it's much easier for us to bring them back on a daily basis, and then that basically changes the whole accounting. So what we see is that uh, the CPIs are quite similar, but the LTV is much higher, and that allows us to spend at scale. Um, Very interesting. We have a pretty unique approach when it comes to UA as well. Um, we're a, a, a dot-com company where VegasWorld.com is the primary place where our customers are coming into. Uh, we don't deal with Facebook very much. We don't feel like it's, uh, it's worth giving them 30% uh, of every dollar the customer spends and also paying them for marketing. So we drive all of our customers to VegasWorld.com and then we drive them to mobile from the domain. Uh, we feel like the, the, the mobile acquisition market is pretty overheated. Uh, I can buy a customer on the web, bring them to my portal for about $1.75, $2.25 which is you know, 25, 30% of what I'd have to pay if I was doing a straight mobile acquisition, and I can convert those players to mobile once they've enjoyed the game, once they've seen, seen that they really enjoy what's going on. And the mobile game's connected to the, uh, to the, the tablet game, connected to the web game, they're all, they're all on the same platform, uh, but we don't, we, don't have to, uh, we don't have to worry about giving 30, Facebook 30% of our, of our revenue. Uh, so it sounds like you guys both have your own like unique niche marketing strategy attached to your specific product and the way you try to differentiate yourself a bit. Okay. Um, I'd love to understand a bit more in depth about um, the research process or how is it that you guys think of the, your new apps, your new products that are going to be a bit different. You know, you mentioned you have four apps, you have two. Uh, how does, is this some kind of a process or a methodological, uh, I don't know what process you go through or do you wake up one morning and say, I have a great idea, nobody's done it so far, I'm gonna be the first. We're really all about uh, search terms. So we're, we're looking for what are people searching for that's in, that's in the you know in the swath of casino games and in, in, in sort of the neighborhood of the casino games. What can we buy? What how can we acquire players mostly from search and just look at you know if there's if there's a lot of searches on a particular category, then that kind of creates a little bit of a, a buzz in the company. Like, well, what can we do for this category of search that's adjacent to our, our casino category? So you're constantly monitoring search keywords, looking at the trends, and looking for new pockets of opportuni opportunity according to what people are looking for? Yep. OK. Uh, we, I can't say we have a very methodological, methodological approach to it. Uh, we're very product oriented. So of course, we have our uh, finger on the pulse, what's going on in the market. So if we see that a, a market is underserved, uh, or that there is a, a new coming app that is targeting a niche, 
uh, then using basically app Annie to see that, uh, what we did was basically uh, about eight months ago, we made the decision that we we're going to broaden our content portfolio and we're going to start releasing games once a week. That allowed us to have a very diverse uh, slot machine portfolio. And then when that niche comes, uh, we actually usually have uh, the first batch of games that we can launch an MVP with, a minimum viable product. So that way, the actual risk involved isn't that high because our platform is built towards multiple apps. And really, the main cost of building an app is the content, mm -hmm. which takes time to build and to optimize, and the user acquisition. So uh, that way, we were able to kind of reduce the risk a little bit, and that allows us to take these bets and not be so afraid of them. But yeah, I mean, mostly it's a lot of market research and just having the finger on the pulse and playing all the games that we can. <laughs> And you know, one of the things that, that we talked about a bit uh, before this panel is that uh, you guys being different is, is not a simple thing to do, right? There's a reason why most of the players are going mass market or taking kind of uh, uh, the approach that many others have succeeded. So obviously, if you differentiate yourself and, and succeed, then the size of the prize is huge. But uh, in reality, many times trying to be different and going unique or niche doesn't end up so successful. And I would love to, to actually hear a bit about that from you guys and if you can share some of the attempts you took that were less successful, what led you to take them and, and how you realized that that isn't the way to go? Uh, so I can uh, tell you about two, uh, let's say, product uh, uh, products that didn't turn out as we hoped for. Uh, one of them was when we built, uh, originally built our product. Uh, the premise for the product was very different. Uh, we were doing slot machines that had uh, dynamic Instagram content. That's why our first product is called Slotogram. Basically, you build a slot. Uh, you can do it with your own Instagram user, with any tag, with any celebrity. And that was us trying. It wasn't really a niche. We, uh, I don't think we understood what a niche strategy was back then. But basically, it was us trying to innovate. Uh, it was very nice, and players loved it. Retention was great. just didn't really pay for it. So we had to pivot away from that. I have to just add that the product was amazing. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, uh, uh, and it was interesting on a UA front. That's why uh, we had a, a very uh, uh, interesting uh, time with Bidalgo, because it was really trying to uh, do something very different. And uh, uh, them being a very uh, uh, data-driven agency, it was really kind of going exactly into the worlds that we were trying to do. Uh, the second product that I think uh, uh, under, um, underperformed uh, with, uh, was Fashion TV, which was a B2B partnership. And the reason simply was that B2B is quite complicated. And uh, we thought that the niche for Fashion TV uh, would be uh, mostly a male audience. Uh, Fashion TV is very big in Europe and very big in Asia. However, uh, we were uh, relying on the B2B partnership looking a bit differently and getting more media from them. So it wasn't really maybe the niche that we didn't tackle correctly, but maybe just the commercials yeah. of uh, running a deal like that. Uh, one experiment we did, which, which didn't turn out uh, as well as we hoped, was um, we licensed Atari catalog, uh, so Missile Command, Asteroids, things like that, because there was a lot of search around classic arcade games. And we thought, well, we'll make, a, we'll make a, a casino around classic arcade games. So we have Missile Command slots, and Asteroid slots, and Centipede slots. Uh, but while it was popular and we were able to get a lot of players into it, the audience that searches for those terms is not a high-spending audience. They're, 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 they don't have the LTV of the, the classic slot player. So lesson learned. That actually uh, leads me to, to my next question. At the end of the day, when you're going niche, you're actually by defi definition saying that you're honing in on a smaller crowd, right? Now, as two people who have actually uh, built great businesses, I'd love to know how you kind of balance between going niche but actually building a scalable business that at the end of the day will bring you guys all the money you're looking for. Well, like you mentioned, we, we also have a, a really robust platform, so it's, it's pretty easy for us to knock out a new SKU, even though it is a virtual world, uh, even though there's like you know, tons and tons of multiplayer games in it, to reskin it and launch a, a set of slots. Atari, Atari Jackpots, for example, it took us 90 days and four people working on it. It wasn't, wasn't a, a huge okay. project. Uh, we outsourced some of the art, got it together fairly quickly. So it's, you know, it, while it might, might cost us you know, all in, maybe 100K, 150K, to build a new SKU like that, 
um, you know, we'll certainly make 150, we'll probably make a half million off the game. It's just that it didn't make the, the, the you know, the millions of dollars that we had hoped to make. Yeah. Uh, f well, I mean, it's a very good question, but that is in the heart of our strategy is that I believe that the market it continues to splinter off. If you look at most of the new coming companies that actually made it very big, if you look at uh, uh, Rocket Games, if you look at Old Vegas, uh, if you look at uh, Merca, they were able to splinter off more and more parts of the market, and I believe that's a trend that's going to continue. And I think that niches, people sometimes tend to think that niches they tend to uh, uh, box the word niche off in something that it's actually bigger. We have what I call a me too approach. We want someone else to basically go in and prove the market and then we're gonna come in with our technology and do it. Personally, my view of the market is simply that this splintering is gonna continue. So what we wanna have is the best technological platform and the biggest slot portfolio possible. And that way, assuming that niches are gonna continue to emerge and I can give you more and more niches that we've been seeing over the last few years kind of succeeding, we're going to just, there are going to be more niches coming. So it's not just targeting one niche and then after that happens you hit a glass ceiling. It's actually just looking at the market. I want to say that the app again is just the delivery method and it's the way to reach the players that are going to have the highest ROI for example. Uh, just from a slightly different approach rather than having a mass market and telling all the players, hey, come play over here and we're going to take care of you and you and you. No, so it's actually, if I kind of hear what you're saying, in a way you can say that companies like Viva or even Merck, you know, you can start with something a bit more uh, niche, but once you do it really well and differentiate yourself, then you kind of open yourself up to closer to the mass market. You can actually build quite a big d uh, user base with uh, a very differentiated product that brings innovation. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, 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 one of the great things about uh, having that kind of niche or multiple niches strategy is that I feel that it keeps our team very uh, agile. It allows us to uh, uh, do different themes and different features because we have to support these different kind of products and that keeps us very agile and very proud of our, us as a product company. I think we're... Uh, 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 doing uh, uh, quite a good work, definitely compared to our size. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that is going to be an advantage is the quicker you are and the more agile you are, the more adaptive you're going to be as the market continues to evolve because it always evolves. Definitely. You have to be quick in this market. So guys, right before uh, we move over to Q&A, because we're just about out of time, if you guys have any closing remarks or anything that you'd like to sh uh, share or advise to this crowd about how uh, to build uh, a good niche product strategy? Um, I like to say that uh, the most important is launch with the smallest possible product that you can. I say that about six to eight individual slot machines are the minimum needed in order to test out a niche. Uh, but do not launch with one line of code that you're not sure is needed because what you want to do is you want to start spending as soon as possible so we start getting data so we understand the viability so we understand if the funnel looks different. And if you work too much on trying to have just a little bit more in your product or trying to do something a little bit more, you're going to waste time and you're going to waste money and that actually will probably reduce the chances of you succeeding rather than getting data as soon as possible and then developing on top of that. Great advice. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about what you guys are up to with Pinterest. I, I think that that's a place where you can definitely identify a, a, a group of people that uh, have a, a like interest and, and create a, a set of slots around those kind of interests and see what happens. It could be fun. We're excited about it as well. <laughs> um, great. So uh, does anyone in the crowd have any questions or something you'd like to ask? I, I have a question. Um, can you give us a, an idea of a niche that um, you think is ripe to be um, exploited that, uh, that no one's done yet? Uh, first of all, I think that adventure slots are being underserved. I mean, it is being, uh, uh, it is a niche that has already been proven. I think Wizard of Oz by Zynga is probably the best proof of that. Now they're leveraging a very good brand. I think there are places uh, to do that without necessarily paying, you know, God knows how much for a brand. Uh, by just having very good content and a very good product. Uh, I think that fantasy slots, um, what Merck are doing with uh, Scatter, I think is another underserved niche. Uh, we're very excited about doing nature-themed slots and basically combining that into adventure 
Uh, and I still think that mechanical apps are still underserved within like just the, the uh, amount of good products. I think that actually you can splinter off even within a niche, you can go and actually target a sub-niche within mechanical slots, which I think is still an amazing market and has been the main uh, uh, growth engine for us. We're super bullish on sports. Uh, almost half of the coins that we suck out of the economy are wagered on sports. Uh, and, so we, and there's so many sports fans out there, and, and nobody's going after that market, so we're going to hit it hard. Thank you very much, guys. A lot of uh, interesting uh, stuff came out of here, so I hope everyone listened well. <laughs>